Deep conversations with the right people are priceless, and ideas are formed in the crucible of authentic, connected, and sometimes controversial conversations. No ideas are off the table because why would they be? Join us on Inquisitive Souls as we lead with curiosity, empathy, and a massive heaping of juvenile humor. Join us on this learning journey. All right, we got a treat for you today. That's something a little different here on the Inquisitive Souls, or maybe in the Inquisitive Souls universe. But um, we're going to do a financial series where my good buddy and business partner, and basically the most, the smartest motherfucking financial guy I've ever met, uh, has had some amazing conversations with people. And since Jeff doesn't have a podcast of his own, wait for it, wait for it. You may hear something uh, between the two of us coming up soon. However, um, it's really important that we get these episodes out because the conversations are great. And uh, like I said, Jeff has so much value to add. And um, it really in helping people redefine the relationship with money. It's not just the, <clears throat> it's not just the, the tactics, it's the, the mindset, I think, which differentiates Jeff and I think is missing from so much of the conversation. So this first episode is me and Jeff um, having a great conversation. You know, money's never been uh, something that I've been particularly, I would say, astute about. Uh, you know, we didn't really grow up in a household where we talked about it. Uh, you know, and there's kind of a well, let's just leave it at that. But regardless, I've learned a lot uh, over the years. And uh, I think we bring it up in this conversation. But there's been a few things that Jeff has said to me, just some of those, you know, words or words of wisdom that you hear at the right place in the right time, uh, that were game changing for me and my relationship with my wife and my relationship with money. So hope you enjoy this show and look forward to uh, more to come. Thanks, Jeff. And uh, I love working with you, motherfucker. All right, Jason McKenzie, so excited to have you here. Thanks for joining me on this uh, first episode. Uh, technically, it's episode number two because we already recorded this once, but uh, the sound quality was terrible. So I thought it would make sense to get you back on so you could actually sound as good as you do in person or close to it. So thanks for thanks for joining me today. I'm excited to go through a series of questions and just you know have our conversation flow. All right, I'm excited to be here. Hopefully, I'll do a better job than I did the first time. Yeah, I'm not counting on it. <laughs> <laughs> all right so so I, what i thought i'd do i mean we explored some really cool stuff last time um and I, I just tell us a little bit about your story you know the the backstory for you you know what your journey has been as it relates to your kind of your adult life and and some of the challenges you faced and where you're at today and what excites you about where you're at today yeah, sure. I'd be happy to. So, I mean, I'll, I'll give you the condensed version uh, so we can take the conversation in some different places. But uh, essentially what happened was, you know, I was living a very traditional life. I was, you know, in my 30s, I'd say or late 20s, early 30s, you know, sort of climbing the corporate ladder. Um, you know, I had all the material trappings that I thought I was supposed to have, like a nice house and nice cars and a pool, all that kind of stuff. And, and, to me, which like that was a validation that what I was doing was working, right? And I, I, when I looked towards the future, what I basically, the way I thought about it was, I'm exactly where I need to be, and that what the future will hold if I keep doing the right things is I will have more of all of the things, like have the same things that I have now, just bigger and more of them. So even nicer cars and a bigger house and a cooler pool and better vacations. And that was really just a matter of me putting in the time and effort at work to you know, earn the income that would provide me the opportunity to have those things. So I think that's a pretty, pretty common way of looking at things. So, um, and my personality type, I guess, was, was sort of, I guess, how to, what's the best way to put this? I guess the way I was behaving was telling me that I was doing the right thing. So in other words, I was an alpha male and I was very conflict seeking and aggressive and um, judgmental of other people and all of those kind of things. You know, I didn't believe that strong people dealt, you know, felt emotions and all that kind of stuff. So, but in my way of looking at the world, that seemed to be producing the results I want. So I never really spent any time questioning it. It's just, I was doing the right things. And then my wife um, got sick. Um, she was diagnosed with bipolar disorder and our entire life pretty much imploded. And 
we went from being financially uh, – so I'll just tell you quickly, actually. Bipolar is a, a mental illness characterized by mania, which is very, very reckless, irrational, grandiose, destructive, risky behavior. And then it's – on the other side of it, it's you know basically soul-crushing depression. And and our entire life went off the rails. You know, our, our financial future that we were building uh, – just as we expected to, we went from that to basically being, you know, some weeks away from bankruptcy a number of times, um, you know, and over the next six years, she, her life just, dis- she, she, it was destroyed. And ultimately in, in 2010, she took her own life. She just couldn't take the pain anymore. And I think she wanted to set us free from, uh, from the chaos and all the, the tragedy and misery. So um, it, was a, it was a tragic loss, and it affects me till this day in ways that I'm only realizing, <laughs> you know, at this point in time. It's been seven years, and I think it's I think it's an experience I'll learn lessons from from the rest of my life. And um, for me, you know, I, I coped with all that in the only way I knew how. You know, I didn't talk about it. I didn't I didn't uh, acknowledge the feelings that I was feeling. I, I because I thought they were weakness. You know, anxiety and stress and sadness and fear and um, panic, uh, all of those things. I wouldn't allow myself to feel them because honestly, I was the only person in my mind. I was the only person that was, uh, keeping things together. And I had to raise my daughters and I had to keep my wife alive and try to keep myself sane in the process. So I started drinking very heavily and, uh, that, that continued for 10 years and, you know, for four years after her death actually. And so all of that is led up to, you know, me, I don't know if you call it post-traumatic growth or, or what, but I stopped drinking and, and, uh, I've really changed the way I look at the world. I, I've, you know, allowed myself to grieve her, uh, Cindy's death, which was a hugely cathartic experience for me. And it happened five years after she passed. And, uh, yeah, I've just been, you know, starting to not starting to, I mean, I've been sharing my story about what I went through, about the, what it looked like to, be in that situation and what I felt and the huge mistakes that I made and all of those things. And so, you know, having a, it's really resonated with people. And so I've done all kinds of things, you know, since that time where I've done speaking, I've written a book, I've, um, I've started a community for people dealing with mental health issues. Uh, we're starting a podcast as well and all, all kinds of different things. But ultimately I think what the main message is, is that, what I always perceived to be, you know, my greatest weaknesses or the the darkest periods in my life, whether it was Cindy's mental illness and suicide, or whether it was my, you know, huge problem with alcohol, those things that I perceived to be weaknesses or tragedies, say, they've turned out to be the source of my greatest contribution to the world. And, and that's been a really eye-opening experience. Yeah, and I, I you know, I, I think it's important for people to know that, you know, we've known each other for... Oh man, probably 14, 15 years now. Yeah. And so I've had the opportunity to kind of see your your transformations happen in real time, um, given that we live pretty much 10 minutes apart. And talk a little bit about when you you stop drinking. And, and this is an interesting one for a lot of people because I don't think you necessarily consider yourself an alcoholic. I think you, you consider that you hid your problems in alcohol and you had a realization which is different than what most people end up going through to quit um, drinking alcohol and the journey that that took you through and the realizations you had for the next four to five months after. Just talk a little bit about that because I think it's really important for people to realize that you can have issues and struggles in your life and it doesn't have to be diagnosed as some specific problem and then how you overcome those really um, can bring light to a lot of different things in your life. I think it's important if you just share that. Yeah, that's okay, for sure. So, you know, I, I think that we, so just to set that up a little bit, um, I think we all live with certain fears that we create about what life will look like if we change the course that we're on, right? And it doesn't really matter what it is. The fear of the unknown is real fear. And so for me, as I was drinking, like, I knew what I was doing at some level was wrong, and but I could not stop. I couldn't stop, and I, I've really, you know, come to understand uh, how badly I was hurting at that time, you know, and 
And, you know, it's funny, we talk about uh, in our community, uh, we talk about no choice choices. And I was, what I needed to do, I was trying to stop drinking by using willpower. And what I needed to do was heal from the trauma I had been through. But I had no idea about that. You know, I just, I, and that's why it's spreading the message that I'm spreading now is so important. So ultimately, like what happened on the last day I, I was, I drank was, uh, I was going to make the day very, very, you know, it was a daddy daughter day for me and my nine year old daughter at the time, who's now 12 and a half. And I told her I was going to make it really special and it was just going to be the two of us and we we're going to do all these things. And, you know, I knew because my wife was going to be away that I was just going to get shit faced all day long. I knew in my heart that's what I was going to do. And that's exactly what I did. I, uh, and so I, you know, waited till 11 o'clock, went to the pub, had a few beers went to the liquor store, got a bottle of whiskey and just drank it the day away. Well, my, my nine year old daughter, this, this amazing human being who I told I was going to make feel special that day, just, she played by herself all day. And at the end of the day, she came up and looked me in the face and told me she was disappointed in me. And that was the lowest point of my life. Actually, uh, everything that happened to me, you know, Cindy's death, that was the lowest point. And uh, so I stopped. And, you know, it's funny. I just talked about this yesterday. I, I've always told this story that, you know, I, her saying that allowed me to confront myself and blah, blah, blah. And, and maybe part, part of that is true, but I'll be totally honest with you. I have no idea why I was able to stop in that moment. I don't know. It's, I've, I just don't know. Mm -hmm. And uh, regardless, what ended up happening was nothing like what I thought was going to happen. So I had created all these fears about, about, oh my God, if I stop drinking, I'm not going to be able to socialize because I didn't know how to socialize sober. My friends aren't going to like me. Um, if I admit that I have a problem with drinking, that means I'm going to be exposed as a liar because I've said it's not a problem a million times over the past years and all of these things. So all of these fears prevent, well, one of the things that prevented me from stopping drinking. So as I moved into sobriety, you know, I, I realized none of these fears came true. <laughs> and I was, I was like, oh, my God, what? None of them came true. And, and what does that mean? What does that say about the way I look at the world? Like, what other limiting beliefs do I have? And, and it was a, an incredibly eye-opening experience to realize that the prison I was, had been locked in was one of my – a big part of it was of my own making. You know, And, man, that was an eye-opening experience. Yeah, let me let me just explore that because I think you hit on a really good point, and this links to some of the stuff that I talk about in my journey with money too. Right? Is oftentimes, and alcohol is a perfect example to look at. Is people look at you know someone who has let's say a drinking problem, quote unquote, and they say they got to fix their drinking problem, right? They got to they got to come to terms with the fact that they're let's say an alcoholic. But in reality, what I just heard from you and what's so important is that people need to address the underlying root cause of why they're drinking in the first place. And, you know, I think about it with money too, for, for me, I was pinpointing all these things in my life that, you know, I was saying, well, this is a problem and this is the problem. It wasn't until I came to terms with, you know, some of the issues that I had with money and how I was treating it and really opened up to my wife and my family about what I was struggling with in terms of managing finances, which was extremely hard to admit as someone who's an accountant, I was supposed to be living mm -hmm. in this image and supposed to be being able to, to do these things, but I had never come to terms with the fact that I was struggling to manage something that I was supposed to be ultimately good at. And when I finally admitted that, just like you said, there were so many limiting beliefs that I had that I was able to overcome. That was the first thing that I needed to do. And I think so many people do is just to admit where they have struggles or where they have problems and be open about talking about it. Because when you talk about it, then you can start to you know, realize, like you said, that maybe all these fears that you had in your head about how people are going to perceive you or look at you or, or think about you were just created because of the, the things that you'd gone through in your past life. So I think it's really important, you know, when you're looking at things that you're struggling with in your life and, you know, whether it's money, whether it's not dealing with, you know, in your case, which was tragic, the death of, of your wife, I think, it's really important that you just admit it and be honest about what you're struggling with because then you can get the help you need. Yeah, I totally agree with that. And I think, too, it's important to tell people that, you know, a lot of times there's a lot of layers of the onion that need to be peeled back. So I don't 
yeah, I don't want people to to think that you know, yeah, you admit something for the first time and bam, you're you're healed, right. you know, or you're on a completely different path. It's it's a journey, right? But the first step is realizing that, like for example, for me, it, it would have been um, it would have been I I hate what I'm doing, you know, right. and and I don't know why I'm doing this, and I it would have take I think it would have taken me a lot of talking about it to realize that the primary reason I was doing it was because I was, you know, not, I had not healed from the trauma of that experience that I had gone through. But, um, but I just couldn't do that. I was just so, and I think this is a really important lesson, What whether it's with uh, anything you're struggling with, is that we try so hard to project the image that we believe that we are supposed to project, whether it's society or people in our family or whatever, it doesn't matter. Or we believe in our, ourself that when we're so busy trying to protect that image and, you know, control what we are showing outward, we don't have time to turn the mirror inward and look at ourselves. And that's, that's where the healing and that's where the growth and that's where the ultimately the, the ability to make an incredible contribution lies. It's inside of us. Yeah. And the, and the key, what you said earlier, right, is that just because you admit that you have uh, this problem or something you're struggling with doesn't mean it's automatically fixed. It doesn't mean that, you know, it's never going to you're never going to struggle with it again. It doesn't mean that it just goes away. I, I think of the stuff, you know, related to me for finances and, you know, communicating with with my wife and my spouse and putting the processes and practices in place we struggle and we go through these cycles over and over again, right? I mean, so for me to project this image that everything's okay and we're perfectly managing fine and, you know, life is all sunshine is just, it's BS, right? Because we still go through those struggles. You know, we sat down this month again and said, you know, we've, we've, we've lost track. We've kind of gone back to some of our old ways and, and what do we need to do to get back under control? Mm -hmm. And we had to go back to ex the exact things we talked about three years ago. You know, it's amazing Absolutely. to me that... We're sitting here three years after the fact going, we got to do the same things we talked about three years ago because it's so easy to tend the other way because you're you're feeling different things as life encounters, you know, as life comes across your path. So um, tell me about, you know, or tell the, the viewers, I guess, because I know this well, there was, there was this journey you went through from the, the point you stopped to really today. But I mean, I can think of some key intervals. And I know the reason I wanted you as the first guest for this podcast was because I think it was about five months after, or maybe a little bit longer. Actually, it was about a year and a half after you you stopped drinking. But I saw this transformation that you went through, and I ended up leaving the company we were both working with. And we we sat down for, I think, some wings in a in a beverage, which was pop or water or something. But at a very sketchy establishment, yes. too, I might add. So yeah, we, <laughs> we probably should have been drinking. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> But, you know, it, it was in that conversation that you gave me permission to start sharing my story and talking about some of the things that I'd gone through because you said it could help people. And, and so that's what I did. And it was, it's been super exciting. I mean, I wrote a book which was, was entirely inspired by you, um, not the story of the book, but me actually writing it. And I, I think of the different times that we went through and, you know, since that point for me, how exciting it was at different intervals to just start realizing how you can reach and impact people. And, you know, we sat and talked about, um, you know, people viewing your, your blog posts and different things like that. I go back to, I actually remember, and I don't know if you know this, I don't know if we've ever talked about it. It was shortly after I think you stopped drinking and we were at um, an offsite for work in Grand Bend. And mm -hmm. I noticed right away, I said, oh, you're not drinking tonight. And, and I don't remember your exact words, but it was kind of like, yeah, I'm just taking a break. And, you know, over the next three, four months, you, you, you know, became open and, and talked about it a little more with me that, yeah, I quit drinking. But in that first little while, I don't think you really came out and told people that I'd stopped drinking and you didn't really, you know, talk about all the things. So how did that process work for you and how long did it take for you to realize that I just got to start sharing my story with people? You know, that, 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 that particular offsite we were at that I was, I had so much anxiety about that, about, about saying that because in the culture that we worked in, 
those are those offsite. I mean, it's certainly not just the culture we work in. I'm sure it's many corporate cultures. But when you go to an offsite, it's just a gigantic bender. Right. right. Yeah. <laughs> That's just what you do. So I had a, a tremendous amount of anxiety because I was the I was always right there, man. At the you know the guy the kind of leading the party. So um, yeah. So you know what happened was. And I think this is also something that's very important is is the process, how the process unfolds and in sharing your story. I mean, it's different for everybody. But one thing that I always tell people is that um, it doesn't mean, you know, OK, tomorrow you need to start barfing your innermost secrets <laughs> all over everybody's face. It's not that it's that. So for me, what I did was, yeah, there was a lot of fear around telling people I had stopped drinking. So that's exactly what I did. I said, yeah, I'm just first it was I'm not drinking tonight. And then it was, yeah, I think I'm going to take a break for a while. And then, and then it was, you know, as my life started to improve and I started to, you know, actually start to explore some aspects of personal development to implement, you know, the miracle morning in my life. And just, I started, I don't know, exploring different ideas and then my life started to improve. And then is when I could say, wow, you know, like I knew even when I was saying, I, from the moment I stopped drinking, I believed in my heart I would never drink again. And I've never, ever had even an inkling of desire to drink again. So so in my heart, I knew I was done. But I didn't want to come across – I guess I was hedging my bets for one thing because still, you never know what – I mean, you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, right? So – and then – but as I as – I, the message changed from, yeah, I'm taking a break or I think I'm going to stop drinking for a while to, you know what? I'm done drinking and my life is so much better as a result of that. And that was when people started becoming interested, like, oh, my God, because how, how did you do that? You know, and it wasn't that I was doing miraculous things or whatever. It's just that I was starting to look at the world more positively and I was feeling better and I was more optimistic. And I, I was starting to see opportunities, not necessarily business opportunities, but opportunities for connection with people in a way that I hadn't before, because I was talking, I started just talking to people when I thought it might be able to help them about the fact that I quit drinking and my life is better. That was it, you know, and, and people were really wanted to know about that because I mean, God, how many people struggle with that? Right. So, and then, then I started thinking, okay, there might be something to this whole sharing this, my story thing. And I, as I looked back on it with the benefit of time and space, I was like, wow, this is a crazy story. You know, my wife's illness and suicide and my, uh, you know, uh, alcohol, you know, quote, addiction. It wasn't really an addiction, but my alcohol, my problem with alcohol and, you know, overcoming that and rebuilding a new family. I'm going to start telling the story. But and then I started I just decided I'm going to tell the real version of the story, you know, like uh, the story where I made some terrible choices in my life when Cindy was sick and all of that kind of stuff. And like the real just the real version of the story. And wow, did that ever resonate with people, man? And I just, people started telling me so many things about themselves. I had somebody come into me at work where we worked, close the door, and a professional woman, you know, highly capable professional woman, tell me she'd been a prostitute for, mo a drug addicted prostitute for most of her 20s. You know, and I'm like, oh my God, why are people telling me this? And I, I mean, I was kind of, I realized that they were telling me this because I was so open about me and the mistakes that I had made that people knew I wasn't going to judge them. Right. And that, that's what it's really all about is, is being the kind of person that can create a safe place for real authentic human connection to happen, you know? And so that's been, it's just such an important thing to tell people that, you know what, the real authentic version of yourself warts and all is actually the one that has the ability to make the, you know, the deepest connections and the most enduring legacy. Why doesn't anybody ever tell you that? I wonder. <laughs> that's yeah, and I think I, I go back to you know what you talked about earlier. It's not, you're just not going to start barfing your story out there to everybody. But one of the things that I've learned through this process is that sharing your story actually allows you to connect people, like connect to people on a human level like I've never really appreciated before. And I think when we talk about being open and honest and start admitting some of the things you're struggling with, what we're saying is do it with the people that you love. Yeah. Right, start there because then you're going to create that connection that maybe has been missing that's going to allow you to overcome some of the things that you're struggling with in your life. In my case, it was money and spending and managing finances. In your case, it was alcohol. Whatever the situation is, start that connection in your own house first 
start being real with the people around you so that you can actually connect to them. And then what happens through that, people start talking you know, to you and opening up and you actually start listening because they're sharing something authentic in return. And that's the, the beautiful part of this, right? I realized it several years earlier than that in, in leadership and, you know, being a terrible leader for, for many years and being humbled with some really tough experiences and going through that and realizing that I just needed to be real with people and honest with people and admit where I was struggling and just start connecting to them. And when I started doing that, I started creating real relationships and started caring so much about the people that I worked with that I only wanted to do things for the people instead of results or instead of money or instead of those other things. So I think it opens up connection to people. And because you created that connection and you're being authentic, you actually start listening to people when they start sharing their stories back to you. Yeah, because they're, you're, you know, that's a great point because they're talking about things that are actually important and matter to them. And, you know, one thing I, I've started saying recently uh, is, you know, is he, because I think people get this idea that, you know, sharing your story is just that, like, you know, really being open and it's too, it's too much. It's too much for people to wrap their heads around sometimes, you know, because there, there's a real belief that we are surrounded by people who want to do us harm, you know, emotional harm. And so what I, what I tell people now, it's, it's, What's really important is the willingness to share your story in the service of others. And that can be as simple as saying to somebody, when I give talks now, I challenge audience members to stand up and look around the room and say, you know, my name is X and I can see that you're struggling. I've struggled too. And if you ever want to talk to me, I want you to know that I will not judge you. That's, that's, that's all you need to do, man. You know, is to be able to let people know that you've also struggled with what does not matter. You don't have to have some magic words to say to them if they come and talk to you. And they may not ever come and talk to you, but they know that there is one person that will not judge them. And that is such an amazing gift that every single person has the ability to give to another human being, you know? Yeah, it is. So, so let's let's jump ahead a little bit now because you made a transition in your life, which I think most people look to, and and I think some people envy, some people are you know extremely happy for you, but but a lot of people are saying, how the hell did he do that, right? How did he do it? And I want to talk about because I know right before we we started recording this episode, we were talking about controversy, right? Mm-hmm. And the the life of service or helping people is what you're doing, right? Is you're actually realizing that you can be authentic with people and share your struggles and how you overcame them. And that can help other people. And now as you, you know, as more people become aware of you, as you become exposed, some people start to, I guess, judge you, right? I mean, mm-hmm. they judge what you're doing and, and challenge that. And I think that's okay. I think people just don't understand. Um, and controversy, not necessarily a bad thing, but you made a decision um, last year to leave your full-time job, and go out on your own and, and live this life of service and trying to help people. And I know a lot of people are saying, how did you do that, right? I mean, how did you set yourself up financially to do that? How, you know, what kinds of things did you have to do in your home? Because I think as parents, many people, many fathers for sure, and, and in some cases uh, women as well that are looking to say, I'm going to become self-employed. I'm going to do this on my own. They worry about how they're going to provide for their family and how they're going to set things up. So that, you know, there's security in the house. How, walk me through the steps that you took to get to that point And then, you know, how you set yourself up financially, what you're doing in your house to ensure that you guys are on the same page, how communication has changed as a result of it. Walk us through that whole process. Yeah. So, I mean, I was able to, first of all, I was able to, well, let me back up a little bit and say what happened with me that led me down this path was that I was doing things. I mean, the work environment that we both worked in was incredibly toxic. That was one part of it, right? Just unbelievably toxic. And um, so that was obviously a contributing factor to it. I mean, if I loved what I was doing, I would still be there, right? But um, but on, aside from that, I would helping people, talking to people and helping them share their stories and all that felt so good that I finally had a sort of frame of reference or something to compare, you know, like, Oh my God, I actually hate this job because even though the environment was toxic, I didn't hate my job. Like it was a, it was a fine job. And I was, I had, I guess some pretty decent 
emotional coping skills. Like I, I didn't, it certainly wasn't ruining my life or anything, but, but, you know, once I had something to compare it to, then I realized, oh my God, I actually do hate this job because this other stuff I'm doing feels so much better to me. And so what I was able to do was I really changed my behavior at work and I, I became much more effective at work. And, you know, because I was connecting with people and all of this kind of stuff. And, you know, we were having deep, meaningful conversations outside the scope of work, which was breaking down barriers at work and all this stuff. So, so, I mean, I was performing at a decent level, a, a high level at work. And so there, they didn't want me to go. So what actually happened was, uh, but our general, the general manager, our boss knew I wasn't happy. I mean, I was quite vocal about how ridiculous and toxic this place was and, you know, and so he sat me down one time. He sat me down and said, look, I know you want to leave. So t tell me what you want to do. Do you want to stay or do you want to leave? And I said, well, I want to leave, man. But, you know, I got to find I got to find something else here. And he said, well, listen, I'll pay you your severance, which was like four, four months or so. And, and you can hit the road. So, I mean, it, in a way, it was awesome because my, you know, the way I was looking at the world and connecting with people allowed me to basically get fired on my own terms. You know, yeah. and which was which was pretty cool. I mean, that was certainly a a nice transition period. So, so, now, so let, let me jump in there, right? So, yeah, I'm just thinking what's going through someone else's mind right now, right? And someone's saying, I got a family to provide for, and four months doesn't sound like a long time. Yeah, you know, it doesn't sound like a long time to to have a paycheck coming in. How, walk through the process of that decision. I mean, was it just like, yeah, I'm doing this. Four months is all I need. How, how did yeah. you come to that conclusion so quickly? Because I'm just sitting back going, you know, if it was four months, I'd be going, wow, that doesn't give me a lot of time to figure this whole thing out, how I'm going to make a living, um, you know, not trading my time for money. And if I can't figure it out, I got to go find another job. How much time do I have to do that? Right. So I would say that that, that confidence was driven by a very high level of naivete. <laughs> <That's insane. laughs> so no i'm being totally honest like yeah. I, in my head i thought oh my god four months jesus i'll be i'll be rolling in the dough in four months right mm -hmm. i actually believe that because uh yeah because i was you know i was writing i had written a book and like just all this stuff i was doing things that were uh, giving me the indication that what i was doing was the you know the right things right so but uh so that was part of it i mean the other part of it i think was was, I guess, fundamentally, how do you look at the few, the present versus the future? So I think what, what a lot of people do is they plan relentlessly for the future without ever, like without living now, right? So mm -hmm. in other words, um, I'll give you an example. Someone we used to work with, actually, you know, Bill Berger, he just died the other day. And, and this guy, he did. Uh, I didn't yeah, know wow. yeah, like, Two days ago. So this is a perfect example, though, of a guy who worked his whole life. Uh, he was in his 60s. He died of lung cancer, and he died two years after he retired, right? And and so the way we kind of talked about it was how long are we willing to try to make this – not yet to, to work away at this before we have to, you know, check and adjust, say. So, you know, so we have a finite timeline. So – I mean, so for example, I've had months where I've had, I've made more money than I was making before, which is amazing. And I've had other months where I basically made none, right? So all in all, I'm not even close to replacing my income. So that's, that can be extremely stressful. But the point is we had a discussion, a lot of discussions beforehand about, so, you know, we've done a, a pretty good job of saving, you know, money for quote retirement and What's that money for? And I think that's a pretty fundamental philosophical question. Is it all for some – are we all saving it so we can have this utopian retirement? Or does it make sense for us to try something different and use some of that money now, right? And so that was a – yeah, it's an ongoing conversation. You know, like this this endeavor – I mean, I know you, you've been kind of through this too and, so, you know, trying to decide what to do. And so this endeavor that I'm doing right now, this is not, if I can't generate the kind of income that I need to, I know that I will eventually. That's, that's, not, that's not even a doubt in my mind. I know mm -hmm. that I'm doing the right things and I've got different streams of income lining up. And, 
And but there's a finite timeline on this for sure. You know, we'll all have to go back to work. It's probably we're, we've been talking about October, right? So maybe five months from now. Mm-hmm. Um, now the other thing is that I've got a number of amazing opportunities lining up, and they're not like so. My original idea was that I had to generate. I was solely responsible for generating all the income I needed to generate. So in other words, I'm a one-man show here. And what I realized is that actually most of the income I've generated and, and have the potential to is, is in partnership with other people, right? So whether it's facilitating masterminds or I've had a few meetings with a company who, for example, a, a woman who owns a company that works with other companies to help them change the culture around mental health. So there's an opportunity there. So it's still trading time for money, but it's, it's doing things that I love to do. So there's 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 so much to to cover or to think about in this entrepreneurial journey. But I guess the point is to answer your question, to get back to your question, it's it's what is the money we saved up for and do we agree about what we want to use it for? You know what I mean? Or what kind and what kind of life? How could it support taking a chance or changing direction in a way that aligns with our core values right now? That's good. So so if if someone else was out there saying you know, they were in the similar shoes to you and they're looking at, you know, potentially leaving their job to become, you know, a full fledged entrepreneur and go out on their own and be self employed. And I think entrepreneur is an often misused word, but let's say self employed. So they're gonna go out on their own. What would you say that they need to do? I mean, get on the same page in terms of the use of your money, but if they don't have a severance package coming in, what what should they work towards so that when they leave their job, they're feeling in a good place that they can provide and they have some security for their family. Yeah. So I would say, I would say like for me, if the job wasn't as toxic as it was, I would have stayed. Right. Right. And I, and I think that would have been financially, that would have been a better idea. Um, But what I would say, we have, we have some commonality on that one. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. So, I guess what I would say is that you need to be really clear on the thing that you want to do. Like what is you, you want to leave, what is your why? Right. So for me, I wasn't totally clear on that. You know, I'm, I'm, I think I'm I'll use quote, think I'm clear on that now, but it's been like when you go from like what I think what I went through and what you're going through is common. Well, you probably have some more clarity, you got clarity more quickly because you knew yours was relate. The thing that you wanted to do and the way you wanted to help people was fundamentally based in, in you know, helping them look at money in a different way. It took me, uh, and it's really amazing that you were able to do that. I've, I've gone all over the map from fathers to leadership to uh, helping salespeople to now I really think what's what my path is, is around mental health. You know, that's, that's, really what feels like my calling now. And so that's part of it, right? So I, I guess what I would, the point is get clear and that cl- get clear on what you want to do, how you want to help people and sort of, you know, some of strategies on how you can do the things that you want to do, because uh, that's, it takes time to figure that out, you know? Yeah, and, absolutely. and so I would say do that before you leave your job. Absolutely. Yeah, and here, here's an interesting point to me. This comes back to something you said earlier in terms of the work environment we were both in, um, and I left obviously before you. But I think of that culture, and you know, what drew me to that culture in the first place was that it was entrepreneurial, right? Mm-hmm. So that the, you know, the president who who both of us knew very well, which was Horst Prelog, at that time was an amazing leader who really fostered entrepreneurship um, based on the principles that I think were in that company from years before and when he left that entrepreneurial nature left with him right it was like the last the last um string that was holding on to entrepreneurship in that organization left when he left because obviously the the president founder had retired and i realized over the past five years or so that for me i mean i'm entrepreneurial but i'm not necessarily an entrepreneur right and so that really helped give me clarity in the last year or so in terms of, you know, I've, I've got a full-time gig. I'm, I'm content in my full-time gig. I feel like I can help people. I can add value. 
And is it entrepreneurial? No. So I have this other passion project that I call it that is helping people with money. And, you know, I'm helping people in a couple different ways. Uh, you know, one is obviously through the conversations that we have, the book that I wrote. Financially, that's doing nothing for me, um, which I'm okay with, right? I mean, the book, most of the proceeds are going to the Front Row Foundation, which is something I'm, I'm passionate about as well. And, you know, I kind of took a step back from the things that I was doing to potentially earn money to say, this for me is about providing value and being of service. I don't need, even though people were telling me that I needed to monetize on it, I don't need to right now. You know, if in the future if there's a way that I can do that and it makes sense to me and it fits with my values, of course I'm open to that. But right now, by taking that step back, I was getting out of balance and I wasn't appreciating, to your point, what I had in my life today. And I was trying to push forward on all cylinders and all aspects. But the one area I was missing was that I wasn't living my life. You know, I, I'd fallen mm -hmm. into this trap. And, I mean, I got sick, which helped me wake up really quickly. But <clears throat> I realized that, you know, I needed to be grateful for the things that I have. And I needed to treasure the time that I have with people. And that especially includes my family, right? So I've, I've been able to step back and say, for me... Even though I thought, because people were telling me that I, you know, eventually needed to leave my job, you know what? Just because someone's telling you that doesn't mean that's the route you have to take. And if mm -hmm. you're if you're an entrepreneur and that's what you want to do, then yeah, by all means, set yourself up, get yourself prepared, have those conversations, you know, get some money set aside so that you can, you know, leave your job and, and reduce that anxiety. And I think that's beautiful about what you said with retirement, because I've talked to a few people that have said that, right? There's this notion that retirement money is for retirement, and people associate that with an age or an after-work after, right. after work type clause. But what is retirement, right? It's, it's when you're living off of passive income or when you're, you know, living off the, the money that you've saved up and you're doing whatever you want to do. And so... To me, if in your case, you're using some of your retirement to fund what you want to do and how you want to live your life to the fullest today and each and every day and serve people, I think that's beautiful. And I don't think anybody should be in a position to, to judge. And that's, yeah. so go ahead. No, I was going to say, you know, I, yeah, you're, you're right. And that's, that's really how I look at it too. And one thing I wanted to, I will say too, is I think, and maybe this will be a, a segue into a different place to take this conversation, but I think one thing that people need to do is you need to do the work to develop the self-awareness about the things that might hold you back, right? So it's not just about developing a platform and a message and a tribe and products and services, all that. It's understanding what makes you think. So, for example, I know that I have some – I have limiting beliefs about money, right? I don't I don't actually really know what they are right now. It's, it's funny because Tanya, my wife, she does not have these. So in our house, for example – she is the one, I don't want to say she makes the financial decisions. That's not really what it is. It's more like, I just trust her. So if she wants to, we just invested in some real estate, for example. And I'm like, you know what? I know that if she wants to do that, she has thought of every friggin' angle possible. Yep. And I don't need to question it. Like, tell me what you're doing. But, uh, but I trust her completely. And so w whether it's my upbringing or what, I, I, there's, there's work that I need to do around the subject of money. And and so and I think that's a really important thing to tell people is that you need to have a high degree of self-awareness because there are going to be all kinds of things that come your way, situations where if you're say for example leaving a job, a regular 9 to 5 job, that you don't ever have to face, you know, whether it's oh, there's all kinds of things. So and and I haven't done enough of that work around the subject of money that I as much as I need to. Yeah, I think by you saying that, you're in the right place, though, right? I mean, I, and I, I, I know Tanya, and I know mm -hmm. she's continuing to educate herself on money, and that's the key, right? To so, As soon as you hear someone say, I know everything there is to, to know about money, I think that's a limiting belief in itself, mm -hmm. right? Because you've closed the opportunity to learn anything new. And, you know, one of the things we talked about earlier today was that Part of the reason I'm going to do this podcast and why I'm passionate about continuing to do it is that it's an opportunity for me to learn more stuff. You know, I, I get to jump on a call and I get to pick your brain about what went through your mind and the things that you had to put in place and the things you had to do about leaving your job. And 
the next person I get on an interview, hey, I, I want to learn about this and how someone you know took these steps to improve this way financially or this aspect of their life, and I can learn from them on how to do that. And I think as long as you're continuing to focus and be self-aware and say, I need to continue to learn in this aspect of my life, you're way ahead of most other people out there. So I think that's, I think you're you're in the right place. You're self-aware. You're admitting what you know and what you don't know, and I think that's a big first step. And I think I agree with you. You're in good hands because I know Tanya continues to educate herself and other people as it relates to how do you live responsibility with money. I just put a garden in, three gardens in, you know, based on her inspiration alone. So <laughs> there you go. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, and that's part of it, right? And for her, for her. Money is energy. I'm sure if you have her on the podcast, she'll talk all about this. But it's, it's that's how she looks at it, and it's it's a really interesting point of view that I have a hard time wrapping my head around. So, uh, yeah. So I guess I guess the point though, I agree with everything you said, and I guess the only point I would make is that when you are launching, you know, say an entrepreneurial journey, figuring that out while also trying to figure out how to best serve people and what products and services to offer and, and connecting with people, like it might not be the best time to do that because it can be overwhelming, right? Yeah. So No, and I like what you said, right? It's a really good piece of advice is that look to partner with people and come up with joint ventures to get yourself um, in a place where you can at least be creating income faster. Because yeah, and then to, and to go back to the beginning of our podcast, to the beginning of our conversation, um, it's those authentic, vulnerable human connections with people that will create those opportunities to partner. Absolutely, yeah. Nice segue right back. So, so let me ask you one question as we as we wrap up here. Um, and I I remember recently we were having a con- conversation where you were struggling to figure out where you really wanted to go with all this. And I know you mentioned it earlier that you're you know, it's it's changed and it went from this to this to this. But I think you've had some clear revelations of late, right? mm-hmm. some subtle changes in thinking that have, from my perspective, looking at you, totally elevated your passion levels again. And I guess my question for you, what questions did you ask yourself or what allowed you to see that now when you didn't see it before? So well, that's a great, great question. So I think what happened with me, one of the things that, I think everybody that can fall, everybody can fall victim to, and especially people who talk, I guess, who make their, ply their trade by talking to people, whether it's giving talks or hosting mastermind groups or whatever, people who sort of uh, preach the same message all the time is you can get, you can get blinders on about that message. So you repeat the same thing so many so over and over and over again and sometimes you realize that the message that you're preaching is actually part of what's holding you back. So I'll give you an example. One of the things that um, I talk a lot about, I would say a lot is in my head and I would say it to other people is the idea of mental health. So I would say I'm sick uh, there's sometimes where I really get sick of talking about mental health, you know, because that's like you know, honestly, Cindy's, she's dead and I've moved on with my life. And sometimes I don't like going back and revisiting that period of my, I feel like I've made the, that the contribution I can make out of that. So, but the, the summary of that is I am sick of talking about this. So that's what I was telling myself. So the idea of doing something in this say area was not even on my radar. And then I realized, you know, it's actually not, it's not that I'm, it's not that I'm sick of talking about it. It's that I'm sick of only talking about it. Right. And there's a huge difference between those two things. So, and, and I think that was always, you know what? I don't want to say that I blinded myself to it. Things present themselves to you. Ideas present themselves to you at the right time, right? At the time that you are able to receive them. And, and I, that's a, that's a kind of a concept that I would have dismissed as like woo woo, uh, you know, a number of years ago, but I wasn't able to see that. So then what I thought was, Oh my God, you know, I know so many people who are struggling with this and and are supporting loved ones that are struggling from this. And God, maybe what if I did more than talking about it? What if I created a community around people? What if I what if I started a podcast and, and you know, learned more about it? Because I feel like it's exactly like what you're saying, right? That's the why I want to do the podcast, man. I want to learn from everybody. And so now we've got this community and I feel like I am actively participating in changing lives every day, but also creating, you know, facilitating a space where other people 
can contribute to changing people's each other's lives every day and letting them see the power they have. Like I had a I had a text from a guy. A guy get this. Actually, this is a guy we used to work with. And uh, he texted me. He joined our group. I don't, I'm not even sure how he found it. And he joined our group and he is in right now he is in the hospital for having suicidal thoughts. And he texted me yesterday. He actually called in for a community call we had the other day from his hospital bed. And he sent me a text yesterday morning and said, basically, and I'm not taking credit for this at all. I'm just telling you what the text he sent was. Uh, he said, you know, thanks to you, I will never again feel ashamed of what I'm struggling with and I will no longer be silent. And I mean, come on, man. When you have interactions like that with people, that's when I know I'm on the right track, you know. So, um, yeah, so I think that's what I feel. That's that's what I feel passionate about. And there's so many opportunities to help people see that they're, you know, hurt and not broken, you know, and and help people like not just lose the stigma of mental illness, but to actually be able to explore some ideas around. Maybe you're not actually mentally at all, not mentally ill at all. Maybe you're hurting. Maybe you've experienced trauma. Like let's let's talk openly about all of the alternatives. So, yeah, I guess I don't know. If, I don't know if that answered your question or not. But see, I get passionate. I start rambling. So yeah, no, that's good. what te- that's what tells me I'm on the right track. Yeah, I, I was in a similar spot, right? I was struggling. I was feeling tired feeling like I had to be this expert and keep talking about my story. And then I realized, holy shit, I don't need to do that. I can just get people on and start talking about their story and I can learn from them and share it with the world. And what a wonderful thing that could be. You know? Yeah. And, and, you know, I think, I think that's what, I think that's one thing that's really important that people don't realize is, is the more you allow your ideas, you know, sort of submit your ideas to the marketplace of ideas, the, the more, the wiser you will become. So, for example, you and I will be forever changed as a result of this conversation. We both said things in a way that the other has not heard before. And so when people talk, sometimes I'll talk to people about this subject and people will say, you know, oh, my God, how did you get so smart? You're so smart about this. And I always say, I'm not smart. God, I failed grade 10 math <laughs> um, yeah, and music. But, but it's just that I talk about it all the time and I talk about it to different people. And it's a dialogue. It's a back and forth dialogue. So I share my ideas. They share their ideas. Sometimes my mind gets changed. Our ideas collide and new ideas come out of it and we create new opportunities and blah, blah, blah. Like if I had spent the past few years fixing bicycles, I'd be amazing at fixing bicycles, yep. right? Yep. As it is, I could barely change a tire. So, I mean, and I think that's what's really important is that you got, you've got to – have the confidence to be able to talk openly about the things that you care about or to be able to ask for help because that's when true wisdom, that's where it comes from, right? Is from talking to other people. Yeah. Yeah. And and it's interesting, right? You talk about telling your story over and over again. One of the things, and it was actually you that introduced me to this, you you, you know, go through a cycle here and I want to talk about this at the end, but of, of learning from people and, you know, I, I used to be your boss, and and now yep. I look at I mean I'm learning from you every time we talk, and I'm I look at you as a mentor to me, and and like you're guiding me through this journey of life. So I, I'm extremely grateful for that, and that's again why I wanted you as the first guest here. But you introduced me to appreciative inquiry, mm-hmm. and you know getting to see that at the Front Row Dads Retreat, getting to see it in San Diego last year. Um, I signed up for the for the training and now the certification with the Flourishing Leadership Institute and John Berghoff. And, uh, you know, I realized telling my story wasn't what I was passionate about. It was about asking different questions and Mm -hmm. and talking to people and asking powerful questions and intentional questions. And that made me start to feel alive and in my interactions at work and in my interactions with, you know, just reaching out to different people and getting to know different people, asking different questions has made me feel alive you know and i was talking to our friend andrew smallwood in uh cleveland earlier this year and he said you know what are you passionate about what are you working on and i said you know what i said what i'm most passionate about what makes me feel alive is using appreciative inquiry in my life and looking at life with an appreciative eye and for that i'm grateful and i owe pretty much this entire journey to you so i want to take the opportunity on this call to thank you for that um i'm i'm forever grateful and I appreciate these types of conversations we have. I think of the time we came back from Philly and we drove, right? It's a 10-hour drive. <laughs> and it, it took us 11 hours because we were too busy talking the whole way. And we, we ended up getting lost. So 
Um, it's just amazing where this friendship has come, and I feel like I'm learning from you, and and I feel like we're learning from each other. And I think totally. So yeah, totally. And I just want to say on that trip to Philadelphia, like I never, I don't believe anything. Like everything happens for a reason, and so we actually missed like of all the turnoffs you could have missed on that entire yeah. like not a thousand <laughs> kilometer journey, we missed the worst one. Yeah. Like the one where there was no recovering from, but that happened for a reason, right? Because it gave us another hour to talk to each other. Yeah, I could have drove for twenty four hours. And yeah, yeah, absolutely. Still kept talking. So, I, I appreciate the conversation today, Jason. I, I guess I want to ask you, you know, and I think I asked you the first time we recorded, right? If you were to, you know, think about twenty years from today, and you were listening to your girls talk, and they were talking about the money messages they received from you growing up, what would you want to hear them say? I think what I would want to hear them say is that um, money and passion and contribution and service and peace, they all work together. You know, they they all support one another. Beautiful. Awesome. If people want to get a hold of you, I know you, you just started a podcast. It's going to be probably coming out soon. You know, how do they get in touch with you? Yeah, so the best way to get a hold of me is uh, at my website, mentalhealthwarriors.com, and people can email me at jason at mentalhealthwarriors.com. Awesome. Well, thank you very much. I will probably take you guys up on the offer to have Tanya on the show as well. Um, we'll probably only have to record once, though, just so you know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thanks so much, Jason. Loved our conversation, as always, and I look forward to the next one. All right, man. Take care. Take care. Okay, everybody, thanks very much for listening to that first interview with Jason McKenzie. It was, a, it was an awesome interview, and all of our conversations seem to be along those same, same lines lately. So truly honored to call him a friend and have him on the show. I hope you've uh, taken some benefit from the stories he shared today. If you haven't got a copy yet of the Your Income, Your Life book, you can do so on Amazon. Uh, please share with your friends if you enjoyed this podcast rate and review it on iTunes so it shows up in more people's feeds, please. I, I really ask you to do that. That's how this podcast is going to continue to grow. And it's going to allow us to continue to share in our experiences and grow from the community. If you haven't yet, please join the Your Income, Your Life Facebook community. It's a private community where we continue these conversations on an ongoing basis. And if you would uh, do me the great honor of leaving a review on on iTunes for this I would appreciate that as well. Thanks, everybody. Look forward to the new episodes coming out shortly and have an awesome, epic day. And how about that? <clears throat> and so uh, if you want to find out more about Jeff, uh, you can certainly go to uh, youringcomeyourlife.com and I'll include all the links to uh, Jeff's community and book and website in the uh, show notes of this podcast, but uh, I want to thank Jeff for the conversation. I want to thank him for being a friend, and I want him to thank him. I want to thank him for being a great business partner and uh, fellow traveler on a voyage of intellectual discovery. Thanks, brother. Look forward to talking soon, and see you next time, guys. Thanks for listening to the Emotionally Excellent Man Show. Now, go own your shit like the powerful, handsome boss man that you are.